Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of In Defense of the So-Called Negro Paganism, Path 5. Important notice, it is not our intention to offend anyone with this video. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone. The goal of this video is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, truth and news are not the same thing. Catherine Graham Recall from parts 1, 2, 3 and 4 that the so-called Negro Paganism is not Paganism is not agnosticism, is not atheism, is not idolatry or polytheism, that the so-called Negro Paganism is actually Muslim, Christian and Judaism propaganda against the Negroes. So the questions become, what is the crime of the man whose so-called shrine was raided? What is the crime of the spiritual leader murdered by the army? Why did the British raid the arrow in the same fashion in 1900 or thereabout? Can truth come from a lie? Again, ask yourself, this is, we are not telling you to believe us, we are asking you to use your brains. Ask yourself, why is it the army that is raiding the shrines? And remember, the army originally was a Fulani or Arab Islamic slave raiding terror group and was renamed Nigerian Army around 1863. Now ask yourself why they are the ones raiding the shrines. That should be your key question. After all, the shrines, they don't carry guns, they don't carry weapons. Why do they use the army to raid them? This should be a question you have to ask. So before we continue, recall that in part 4 of this series, we told you that we were going to show you how they use different iterative techniques of lying to change the identity of the Negroes and the victims of their atrocities. So how they moved from Negroes to African and why and the techniques they used in uh, doing that. So let us reference a book called Atlas Antiquus, 12 Maps of the Ancient Worlds for Schools and Colleges by Dr. Henry Kaipath and it was published in 1876. There we see the following. So from this book we see a map that shows us what the place that we call Nigeria today and we call Guinea or Negro land used to be called and it was called Ethiopia which you can see a slightly different spelling which we can attribute to their revisionism you notice that it spells A-E-T-H-I-O-P-I-A which is Ethiopia if you remove the A so now when you are looking at Ethiopia today it is not the same Ethiopia as the one in the Bible but because the Negroes do not think backwards enough, they don't ask basic questions that predate the history, they just follow their leader. That's the spirit of slavery. That's why they are able to sell the dummies of Christianity, Islam and Judaism to you. And they are unable to sell it to the Japanese or Chinese. And at least you can see that the Chinese are doing well today. The Japanese are doing well. You are the worst off in the whole equation and you are still running after their gods. So this is what we wanted to show you so you understand how the changes are made. Let us also reference a book called Negromania being an examination of the falsely assumed equality of the various races of men demonstrated by the investigations of whoever and it was written by John Campbell and it was published in 1851. So we see the following. The woolly haired tropical dark colored stalk improperly called Atlantic and Ethiopic is considered to be most distinctly typical where the maximum of development is found in the peculiarities of structure and faculties that distinguish it from other normal forms. This is our interest here, the Ethiopic. So we also reference the war in America, Negro slavery and the Bible, a political religious essay by an old politician published in 1862. So there we see the following. God had so constituted this race, which in the times of the scriptures were called Ethiopians, 
and which we call Negroes from their color, that they might become the inhabitants of the equatorial or warm regions of the earth. So the, our interest here is just the Ethiopians. We will address all the other things they talked about later. Now that you have seen the different iterations of their lives, because they moved from Ethiopians to Negroes, which you have seen, and today they are in African, we don't know what they will be in tomorrow, but the target is the same people, the Negroes. So let us look at the map from the University of Princeton, which you can check on their site yourself. Is a map of Africa in 1710. You see how they now divided it into Negro land and Guinea. And then further down on the bottom right, you see where it now says Ethiopia. So you must know that today the modern day Ethiopians have nothing to do with the ancient Ethiopians or the ones you read about in the Bible. The reason is their revisionism, they use it to label people, change identities in such a way that they can continue their atrocities unnoticed. So this is why you see while some parts of Africa are killing the others, some people in Africa will be rejoicing. You notice that there is no terror in Africa that calls for UN resolutions and all that. It is deliberate. They know what they are doing. So ask yourself if all these people were the same. Let's say the Negroes were the same as the Fulanese, the Barbers, the Tuaregs. Why will anyone be happy to kill his brother? Let us show you one example of what we are talking about, which we shall do much later in this video. So let us show you a different iteration of their revisionism and lies, because it's important you understand how the slave master works. Remember when you go to the church or mosque, you are not told what the Almighty wants you to be told. You are told what the slave master wants to tell you, to divide you. Remember hypothetically speaking. If you had twins, two twin babies today, and you bring one up as a Muslim and the other up as a Christian, you have divided them forever because none will grow up to agree with what the other is saying. Now we ask you if these things were true as you are made to believe, why are they so different? They wrote it down clearly that that's what they are doing with it, which we shall show you right in this video. So let us look at a book called Negroland or light thrown upon the dark continent, the history of African exploration and adventure and it was written by Charles H. Jones and published in 1895 or thereabout. So we see something very interesting in the republished work. Now look at the same book republished in 1971 and you will understand exactly what we mean by revisionism. And the reason they make these changes is because they know that the Negroes do not think backwards enough. So you see that the title of the book has now changed to Africa, the history of exploration and adventure as given in the leading authorities from Herodotus to Livingston by Charles H. Jones and it was originally published in 1875 but republished 1971 with this change. Your question should be, whoever made this change, why did he make the change? And the simple answer is because they no longer want to refer to you as someone from Negroland. They want to obliterate the Negro identity. They want to obliterate Negroland as well. This is why you see people like Oprah Winfrey, who claims to be a descendant of former slaves, but went to build a school in South Africa because she now sees Africa as where she could be from instead of Negroland or Guinea where the slaves were stolen from. No slaves came from South Africa. None came from Somalia, modern day Ethiopia and all those places. But you see how they are using the Africa to make everybody look like the same, but they still know who the targets are. So this is why they do a lot of things and hide behind the appellation of African and the Negroes do not say this. So you see it from this book now. So we're going to show you a little other details of what they are doing so that when they play the trick, you will say it. You may not do anything about it, but you will at least see it and identify it for what it is. Treachery. Please keep in mind that this is still about Negro paganism but we may have digressed in order to capture the revisionism and how they turned the true worship to what they call juju and the wrong things today. So let us reference the Journal of Negro History by Kata G. Woodson, the editor of volume 2 and published 1917. So we see 
During the 18th and 19th centuries, the slaves were obtained by a variety of methods, of which the most common was that of raiding the agricultural negrations who lived in towns and cities scattered and unorganized in the agricultural zone and who were easy victims of the mounted bands of desert barbers, Tuaregs and Arabs who descended into the region in quest of booty and captives. So now, if you're a Negro and a Muslim or Christian, how come you believe that the Arabs who were capturing and selling your forebears as slaves, as beasts, are lower than cattle, can bring you salvation? That should be your question. If you can answer that question, then we can begin to see why you even have to go there at all. So now, let us move further down on the right of the same page. So here it tells us that the Felathas, who since the beginning of the 19th century have been the dominators of the Negritians in West Africa. Remember, Negritia is Nigeria. It's the same name, it's a synonym. So when they iteratively lied and changed to Nigeria because they had Nigeria and Negritia side by side, that was when they now came up with the lie that uh, Luga, Damaga, Method and all that. These are all lies. The reason they tell those lies is to hide behind these Arabs to be unleashing terror. If you doubt what we are saying, just Google Fulani Headsmen and you'll see the volume of terror going on in what is called Sub-Saharan Africa today. Because they are still doing their slave raiding, but in a different way, by killing people now, because that's conquest, that, that's what they are after. The Christians are still providing them with the weapons. So, but let's go further down. It tells us that they used to carry on a merciless campaign against their subjects, destroying their homes and fields, and seizing women and children by the thousands to batter away to the west. Or to send across the desert, describing the effects of a felata raid, Bath says, the whole village, which only a few moments before had been the abode of comfort and happiness, was destroyed by fire and made desolate. Slaughtered men with their limbs severed from their bodies were lying about in all directions and made passers by shudder with horror. So you see, they are doing the same thing till today. If you think it has stopped, just ask anyone in Sub-Saharan Africa, in places like Zamfara, in places like Benue in Nigeria, which was Negritia here, just ask them what it is like. They are still doing it because they are working closely with the Christians who provide the weapons. Remember, the weapons, the guns, the bullets are manufactured by Christians. Whether you want to believe it or not is a fact. Now, it is the Muslims which are unfortunately the Fulanese, who were Arabs then, that are doing the reading. Now we are going to tell you how these dots connect in this video shortly. So here we see the chief not having a sufficient supply of slaves on hand to trade caused his big drums to be beaten and organized two bands of troops to execute a raid among the heathen tribes in the east and southwest. The raiding bands attacked only tribes with whom they were at war or who refused to adopt the Mohammedan religion. So now you are telling us that this religion that people have to be killed, slaughtered, captured in their numbers to sell to those who gave them the weapons, that's the Christians and the Jews, can be the true religion and reverencing the almighty creator of heaven and earth that created even the Negroes. If you say that is true or possible, Please put it in the comment section why you think it's possible, because it's impossible. And remember, these their are conquest and terror. It's not done to Japan. It's not done in China. It's only on Negroes. So if the Most High wanted his message to be passed on, do you think he has to do it by killing people? Have you seen where they preached and the people said, oh, no, we're not? Now, remember, get it very clear. The idea that the pagans were killing or sacrificing humans is a very big lie. If you want to understand how that lie works, because it's a Christian and Muslim uh, propaganda and takia, which is what you see the United States use all the time against its victims. It starts by telling you all the evils they have done or planning to do. You'll see the example now is your North Korea. 
Did they not start telling us how North Korea is evil, North Korea is giving trouble, even some people started getting agitated and started condemning North Korea for doing nothing, didn't even hear from their side. So if you understood how the North Korea propaganda worked, that's exactly how the Negro propaganda worked. So they came up with the paganism is this, they are sacrificing humans and they say it in such a way that you will think it is true, unless you remember to ask them for an example. Which when you do, they go back, go and do it themselves. You notice that the same people providing the weapons to the Muslims are the same people trying to convert the people to what they call true religion. So you see the treachery. They are the same people that are stealing people and the, even their scriptures, the Bible tells them that whoever steals somebody should be killed. So they, they now leveled a, an accusation of uh, the Africans were enslaving themselves because they were using those who were supposedly non-Negroes against the Negroes. But let us not digress so much to show you how this revisionism works in the corporate world as well. Now look at how they deployed their revisionism on the Negro Journal so you understand what we're saying because we're going to show you exactly how the trick is played. So you see that the Kathaji Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies at the University of Virginia, Negro has completely been removed. So between when they were called Negroes, that's from 1434 when the slave trade started to 1900 when the slave trade finished. They were Negroes. Now, we don't know what they were before then, which could have been Ethiopians. It could have been anything. So now, after they are done with Negroes, they are still doing the same thing, which we are still going to show you. But they are no longer being called Negroes. They are now being called African. So you see how they moved the, the whole thing, changed it. Because the Negroes do not read. They don't read between the lines. They just take whatever the slave master offers them. That's why you see. You see the Kathaji Woodson that was the editor of that Negro magazine. In your mind, you're going to say, oh, they have immortalized him. But why did they remove the Negro? That should be the question. Where did we have a meeting with them and say, oh, we don't want to be called Negroes anymore. We want to be called African-American. Think about it. If somebody is called an African-American, does it include the Arabs? Does it include the Fulanese? Does it include the Barbers, the Tuaregs, the Somalis, the Ethiopians, the Egyptians that look different? See, while they tell you African American, they know who they are looking at. They know who they are referring to. You may not understand this very well, but let's read the content of where they describe the Institute so you understand what we are saying. So here you see about the Institute founded in 1981 the University of Virginia's Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies is named in honor of native Virginian Carter Godwin Woodson born in 1875 in Buckingham County to parents who were formerly enslaved. Woodson went on to earn a PhD in history at Harvard University in 1912 only the second african-american to receive a harvard doctorate his predecessor being the eminent scholar w.e.b de boer woodson was instrumental in bringing professional recognition to the study of african-american history during a period when most historians held the opinion that african-americans were a people without history he founded the association for the study of negro life and history in 1915 later to be renamed the association for the study of african american life and history and its scholarly journal the journal of negro history now the journal of african american history in 1916 so you see we are looking at the journal he created as journal of negro history but they have now changed everything to african american history now tell us somebody who claims to be an intellectual or a scholar that has no hidden agenda is studying african-american history is it the history of the slaves or former slaves or their descendants or the one of the arabs that captured and sold them or the likes of the fulanese the canaries the zulus the hottentots the bushmen the pygmies the somalis the ethiopians that are in africa so which of the history is he indeed talking about and remember in this history you won't see them tell you about the negro land you won't see them tell you about ethiopia that was the name you won't see you see them go beyond the limit they want you to know that's because they are working very hard 
to obliterate the Negro identity and continue the subjugation, which is what they are still doing, which we are still going to show you. That is why you see the army is the one that raids the, the so-called paganism or pagan shrines while supporting and defending the murderers, Christians and Muslims in their uh, subjugation and enslavement of the Negroes. You see what is going on. So, let us reference a book called The Fullers of Central Africa and the African Slave Trade by W.B. Hudson of Savannah, Georgia, written in 1843. We see the following. The Fullers are not Negroes. They differ essentially from the Negro race in all the characteristics which are marked by physical anthropology. They may be said to occupy the intermediate space betwixt the Arab and the Negro, and this is all we are interested in. And on the other side of the page, we see the following. In the Mithridates of Adelong and Veta, the opinion is expressed that the Fulas belong to a middle race between the Negro proper and the African white race. So now we ask you, those that are talking about African-American history, does it include the white race that are in Africa too? Now, if you do your research, you will discover what they are doing. It is very clear, but it's hidden in plain sight. But let's move forward. So, you see, from the highlighted portion, just after where it says, Otsman the Destroyer, that's the prophet of the Fulanese at that time. So, you understand what is going on. And that's the wholesale merchant for Negro slaves. So, if you are telling us that Islam is of the Most High, of the Creator of Heaven and Earth, and it is the same that is mandated people to be killing others, including women and children. Then we need to ask you how. Explain it to us. Now, please don't come with the argument that, oh, no, other people were abusing it. No, that's not correct because there is no way the Christians that are doing the same thing with the Muslims in alliance can be said to be other people abusing it. And you come with the same excuse. Why don't you come with the same excuse for the so-called pagans if it was genuinely paganism? So now we see where it tells us that the Fullers are rigid Mohammedans and according to Malian, the French travelers report, they are animated by a strong zeal for proselytism. They are the missionaries of Islam among the pagan Negro tribes where they have conquered, they have forced the adoption of the Quran by the sword. And whilst pursuing quietly their pastoral occupations, they become schoolmasters, mayalims, and thus propagate the doctrines and precepts of Islam. Wherever the fuller has wandered, the pagan idolatry of the Negro has been overthrown. The barbarous fetish and grigri have been abandoned. Anthropophagy and cannibalism have been suppressed and the horrible sacrifice of human beings to propitiate the monstrous gods of the Negro barbarian has been supplanted by the worship of true, the true God. Now, if you check the army that is in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa today, the army was originally the slave raiding army. So now, the weapons they are using, the bombs and bullets, are made by the uh, Christians and Jews. But being used by the Muslims to kill the so-called pagans to stop an alleged human sacrifice. Now ask yourself, if there was no power in those things, why are they interested in stamp stamping it out? Just ask yourself these simple questions. Remember, the, the person that made the gun did not make it because it is a weapon of love. It's a, a weapon of death. The bombs are weapons of death. The army are weapons of terror. Whether you want to believe it or not, anyone in the army is just a murderer dressed in borrowed robes of whatever. So now we ask you, if Islam and Christianity were through to the creator of heaven and earth, how come they are working together and killing other people, innocent people for that matter? So let us move forward. So let us look back in time in order to see how the dots connect between the raid in shrines or so-called shrines and the, the history of it. Remember, this was the same way the British raided the arrow and accused them of human sacrifices and slave trading, which is a very big lie from the pit of hell. The only reason the lie is standing today is because Negroes do not read. And like we told you, there is no way Elmina, Ashanti, and all those places where the slave forts are can be where the slaves are from. Because if you have seen that they burned down the entire community and captured the slaves, you are telling us that they, they built the forts where they are capturing them from 
and there are still people remaining there remember the reason you believe their lies of how the slave forts or elmina ashanti slaves are there is because you have not taken time to study it if the way they capture the slaves is by surrounding an entire village and burning the whole place down and capturing everyone like animals there is no way there will be people remaining near ashanti or any other slave fort in sub-saharan africa today there is no way if you check it very well so but let us move forward by referencing a book called narrative of an exploring voyage up the rivers Quora and Benue, commonly known as the Niger and Shada, in 1854. Notice the revisionism again. The rivers were called Quora and Benue, and then later they are called Niger and Shada, and it's in 1854. And it was written by William Balfour Beke. This Beke is the same Beke or Beke. Why the, you notice that the Igbos, the Igbo Negroes, call the white people Beke today? That's the one so if you can connect the dots so it was published in 1856 so we see the following so we start reading from just above the highlighted portion and it tells us that not far from this stands the noted city of aro or ano where is the celebrated shrine of chuku or the deity to which pilgrimages are made not only from all parts of Igbo proper but from old calabar from the tribes along the coast and from Oru and Nimbe or Brass, the city is described as being nearly three times the size of Abo and as extremely populous. The inhabitants are skillful artisans and manufacture swords, spears and metallic ornaments, specimens of all of which I have seen and can therefore testify to their being very neatly finished. The town is always mentioned with great respect almost at times with a degree of veneration and the people say Chukwa Abiyama or God lives here. So this is our interest. You can see that there is no way you can say this is idolatry. Remember it says they called it shrine not because it's a shrine. They called it um, deity not because it's a deity. Let us now try to understand why they are doing what they are doing by referencing a book called A History of the Colonization of Africa by Alien Races, written by Sahari H. Johnston and published in 1899, we see the following. Paganism will disappear. The continent will soon be divided between nominal Christians and nominal Mohammedans. So we go further down and it tells us that Yet, before Mohammedanism loses its savour, there will probably be many uprisings against Christian rule among Mohammedan peoples who have been newly subjected to control. The Arab and the Hamite, for religious reasons, may strive again and again to shake off the Christian yoke. Note the word Christian yoke, but I strongly doubt whether there will be any universal mutiny of the black man against the white. The Negro has no idea of racial affinity. So you see what we're talking about. That's why they are doing it. They know that if they go with the army to the so-called shrines, intimidate them, accuse them of all kinds of uh, fraud or anything, murder, blood, human sacrifices, they will prevent people from even looking at that area, looking at the religion or what it means. Now think about it. The Christians make the guns and the bombs. They pass it on to the Muslims to be killing you. And then the priests that have something that can prevent the bullet from piercing your body. Whether you believe it or not, if you doubt what we are saying, go and ask questions. They are now telling you that one is the devil. And the one that is coming to kill you on a promise of a so-called everlasting life that no one has ever been there. Remember, whether you want to believe it or not, neither the Arabs nor the Europeans, that's the Christians and Muslims, nor the Jews has ever seen God before. So if they are telling you to allow yourself to be killed on the premise that there is some paradise, ask yourself, why is that paradise not good for them? Why don't they kill themselves first? So you notice that if there was any power in Christianity and Islam, the imams and the priests would have all, all been arrested like they are arresting the so-called pagans. Ask yourself, why the army can be going to raid a, a, a so-called shrine that has only one person, the chief priest? if it has nothing to do with what we are talking about during the slave trade because the chief priests were also able to predict when the slave raiders will be coming at that time yes there may be loopholes here and there anyway but the challenge is if 
you go to the Christian church, they still shoot you with guns made by the Christians. And you go to the Muslim mosque, they still shoot you because they are using the guns made by the Christians. Now, tell us what makes the, the so-called pagans and the so-called shrines of the devil. While the ones that are murdering you, killing people, innocent people, are now so-called children of the Most High. This should tell you how treacherous these so-called ideologies, because these are not religions and they are not of the Most High, how treacherous they are. So from the same book, we see where it tells us that unfortunately, any race of purely Negro blood accepts and loses Christianity with great facility. The Negro, unless he be Mohammedanized, note, note that, that's unless he is made a Muslim, note that again very well, unless he is made a Muslim, that is why you see that the slave masters and the Arabs all work together to support the terror being leashed out on Negroes in sub-Saharan Africa to see how best to convert them to Islam. Now, we ask you this question. If Allah and God of Christianity are really the same from any angle you want to look at it, why are they interested in moving you from one to the other? Remember, they came first and said, oh, you were pagans. Now, you became Christians. They are also trying to bring you to Muslims. And somehow, you are yet to decode that these two things are two sides of the same coin and they do not reverence the Most High that created heaven and earth. So unless he be Mohammedanized, he is easily converted and as easily relapses into gross superstition or a negation of all religion, including his former simple but sound ideas of right and wrong. Now look at where it says is easily converted unless he is Mohammedanized. So this is why you notice that they are pushing for Islam. And they are trying to use the force, the terror of the former slave raiders to make the Negroes become Muslims. Now ask yourself, if the God of Christianity and the God of um, Islam are really the same, why will it be easy for you to revert from one to the other? Why will they be injuring the same people that brought you Christianity? Why would they be aiding the Muslims to make you Muslims? Why are they afraid of what they call paganism? That should be your question because it doesn't make sense that you go after a deity that cannot protect you ahead of one that can protect you. Remember, if there was nothing, something about the Negro religion, whatever they call it, whether they call it paganism or not, they are not the creator. They are just human like you and I. So if there is nothing about it, why are they interested in stamping it out? Remember, it is not about what they say or what they did not say. If they claim is idolatry, who made them rulers and judges over us? Why don't they take that their religion that they think is civilization to Japan and China and convert them to Christians and Muslims and let's see them first? So why do we allow them to continue insulting our intelligence with their lies? When we can read, it's not like they have seen the Most High before. Neither the Arabs nor the Europeans have seen the Most High before. So you may have seen where it said that unless the Negro is made Mohammedan, it's easy to convert him from one to the other. Let us see where they got that from. Remember, for everything they are saying, they knew what they are saying. They have tested you. They have seen how big or how small your brains are. They know how to use you. They know how to lie and you believe because whatever lie they tell, people believe them without verifying. Like if we asked you today, if you know the day the first Bible was printed off the printing press, you wouldn't have ever thought of that. But remember, the printing press must be discovered before you can print the Bible off it. So the manuscript may be something you will start thinking about where they have it or where they got it from. Having said that, you see where they got the idea of using a Negro or a black person to sell any idea they want to the Negroes. So you see where it tells us that, moreover, the influence exercised by a Negro preaching to Negroes was naturally far greater than that of a white man. The Negro knew the ways of his fellow countrymen. He could talk to them in their own language, whereas the European missionary who addressed his congregation by means of an interpreter was regarded with a certain amount of suspicion. The white man's God must be white, the simple pagan would argue, and could have no concern in the affairs of the black man. But to see a man of their own color upholding the new faith gave them confidence. 
So you see where they got that from. Let us show you some history of why they figured they need to do that. So let us reference a book called Savage Africa being the narrative of a tour in equatorial southwestern and northwestern Africa by W. Winwood Reed and it was published in 1864. So here is a narrative of the Ken and Abel story that is totally different from what is common. So you see what we mean by understanding the history of all these religions before we start practicing them. So here you see a narrative of the Ken and Abel story presented as the origin of the white race. So it tells us that after Ken killed Abel, his brother, when the almighty creator asked him, where is your brother? He turned white out of fear. You can pause it and read it yourself. The video is already long enough, so we need to move forward. So let us reference the West African countries and peoples, British and native, written by James Africanus B. Horton, and it was published in 1865. We see the following. The religion of the Igbos is Judaism, intermixed with numerous pagan rites and ceremonies. They believe in the existence of one almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent being, whom they worship as such, and regard as the omniscient God who concerns himself with the affairs of man. He is known by the name of Chuku, contracted sometimes into Chi. They also admit the existence of another god or a superior being who in one part of the country is called Orisa and in another Chukuokike or God the Creator or the Supreme God. So how can you call such a people pagans? So if you go further down, it says Chuku the omniscient God who is supposed to preserve them from harm communicates with his people through his priests who reside in a city set apart as holy by all the nation. This place is called Aro or Ano, to which pilgrimages are made not only from all parts of Fibo, including the tribes along the coast. So before we conclude, let's look at a book called Satan and we look at a very interesting picture. This is an old book about Satan. You notice that where the so-called angel is stepping on his head, he was still white. But suddenly, they've been able to use their revisionism and change him to black because they needed to paint the Negro as black and as devilish and as evil as possible. So you understand what we're talking about when we say revisionism. And here we come to the end of this edition of In Defense of the So-Called Negro Paganism Part 5. We hope we have been able to provide you with some thought-provoking topics you could research on. We also hope we have been able to enlighten you. We hope you will find time to conduct your own research or at least look for the materials referenced and study them. Remember, if what the slave masters brought was true, if they were genuinely from the most high creator of heaven and earth, you will probably be the last to say it. They will never allow you say it. They will patent it and you won't even be able to access it, let alone start being the ones ahead of it. It is time for you to use the brains the Most High blessed you with and look at the granularities of what they brought and ask yourself, of these things they brought, which one is genuinely true? Which one is correct? We thank you very much for listening and we do hope you will find time to conduct your own research. Peace.